Welcome back. So, um, the next little while before lunch, I'm going to try and get through as much of network visualization as we can cover. So, um, the idea, um, I'm going to go over a few slides just to introduce some concepts, give you some tips, tell you a little bit more about network visualization, and then, um, which is, is mostly based on the ideas presented in the how to visually interpret biological networks um, primer that you guys, uh, that was distributed before the class. So if you read that, this will be familiar. Um, and then we'll move to um, uh, interactive demo of Cytoscape software, which is a, net, a free network analysis and visualization software that is developed by many people, um, including, including us. And, um, and then that's a, a fairly powerful tool, so I'll just try and spend the rest of the time going through the basics and, and answering questions about, about specific things. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to cover just a few topics, so the lecture is not going to be that long, actually, and we'll be able to get into the demo pretty quickly. Um, and then I think in the, the afternoon we'll, we'll, we'll go into more, even more uh, detailed stuff, so the, the this part, next part is going to be the basics. So, um, okay, so we, t we heard about networks uh, in various different contexts. You can have molecular interaction networks, you can have fun uh, associ functional association networks, um, and uh, pathways are, are types of networks. Um, there's a lot of network data in biology, and networks are generally useful, um, as we heard about, for kind of figuring out relationships in your data. Look, you, you vi and, and it's really particularly useful when you visualize those those relationships as this visual network, and you you interact with it. You can move the the, the nodes around. You can see um, how things are connected, how data is connected to each other. There might be specific regions that are, that are interesting, which I'll talk about. So, um, but for networks to be visualized, you um, you have to lay them out. Um, and there's there's this idea of automatic network layout. So if you didn't, if you if you just took all the connections between all of your data and you plotted them fairly randomly, it would look like this. And it's not very, it's not very um, easy to interpret. Um, but after, so this is sort of before layout, and after you, you lay out the network, um, this is the same network laid out, um, and the, the layout serves to reduce the overlap between nodes and edges. So it, it um, tries to organize, it tries to arrange the, the nodes so that they're, they're, um, there's as little overlap as possible. And in effect, it actually most of the time is putting together nodes that are highly connected closer together, and nodes that are uh, not very connected, like like this node and this node. They're they're sort of further apart from each other. So that's sort of the general general idea. Um, and you can do this manually um, if you want, but it would take a very long time. Um, and so there's a number of different automatic layout algorithms that people have developed to to lay the the information out. And I'll show you those. Um, interactively in, in Cytoscape later. Um, so the layout algorithm that I, um, I should have showed some more pictures of this, but the layout algorithm that, that we used for this network is called force directed. Um, there's a, it's sort of a, a general class of um, layout algorithm where um, <coughs> that actually has various different names, um, but the idea is that it represents the network as the, the algorithm works by thinking about the network as a physical system where nodes are pushing away from each other, they're repelling each other, it's sort of a repelling force, and edges are, like interactions between the nodes, are pulling them back. And um, if you think of that a whole network with those forces, um, opposing forces interacting with each other, the layout algorithm, force-directed layout algorithm actually simulates this physical system and says, okay, you know, if we calculate all these forces, and we update and we iterate over that, eventually you you get a um, a uh, um, a network where um, things are, are the, the forces are sort of evenly balanced, and you can uh, it's sort of like if you if you had a real network of springs and um, magnets or something, you could throw it up in the air and it would all jumble around and land, and it would probably um, be organized more similar sort of similarly to a force directed network. Um, so it, um, there's there's other types of network layouts like hierarchical. Um, which I'll show you show you a picture of later. If you have a data that looks like a tree, like the gene ontology networks that I that we talked about yesterday, um, there's there's automatic layout algorithms that put the root of the tree at the top and 
Um, or if you have a phylogenetic tree, for instance, they put the root of the tree at the top and they, they, they have a sort of more tree-like um, result. So, um, but in general, force-directed layouts are the kind of general ones that, that work best for most networks. Um, so, and one of the, so just a, a couple of different tips here for how to work with networks. Um, network layout, automatic network layout is good for um, not very, very big networks. So once the networks get too big, you've seen some examples of this, like that big uh, orange hairball network that Lincoln, Lincoln put up, um, which, which um, I actually made, made a long time ago, and now it's like the, the, uh, the example of what not to do with network layout, because it's a, it's a really big hairball and you can't see what's going on in it. Um, um, so network layout algorithms are, are good. They work really well for smaller networks up to 500 or, or 1,000 nodes. Something like, something like this it works really well with. Um, and if, there, if there's not too many edges uh, connecting everything, so if, if there was an edge connecting everything to everything else, you would never be able to get rid of the edge crossing. So all the edges would be crossing each other and it would look more, it would look more like this. Um, so if you have, um, and so this is something that, that happens all the time, people say, people use these automatic network layouts and they still get a hairball. Um, so um, to avoid hairballs, um, and that, that happens with when the, there's too many nodes and edges and the network layout algorithm can't figure out a way of, of, of um, presenting the data clearly. So um, if you have something like that, it's a good idea to reduce the number of nodes and edges. And one way to do that, and I'll show you how to do that um, in Cytoscape, one way to do that is just focus on a specific area of interest. Um, or if, you, if your edges in the functional association network that Lincoln showed, where the edges represent um, different types of relationships uh, and with, a, with a score associated with it, you can just look at the best scoring edges. So if you have some score on a protein interaction, the that represents the confidence of the protein interaction, and you're getting too many too many edges, then just reduce the, um, remove edges that are less confident and just look at the, the top confidence ones and see how the structure of the network looks and you can gradually add information. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a number of different types of layouts which I'll mention. Um, force, as I said, force directed is, the, is the, probably the best general one um, and so that's probably always a good one to try first. And then um, there's other types of networks that work better for different, for like uh, the hierarchical, as I mentioned, um, network layout works for tree-like networks. Um, so network, automatic network layout can do a pretty good job with, with mo many networks, but if you want to really make a publication quality network figure um, that eventually, once you've figured out how, to, how your network is, um, how to, how to um, visualize your data, um, it's really a good idea to manually adjust the the network layout by moving the nodes and edges around, and I'll show you how to do this. And also, when you're finished, if you load the if you load the network into a drawing program, um, a lot of figures that you see in papers, the network has been loaded into a drawing program, and then people add things like arrows or highlights, and um, they might move labels around. Um, and so that's that's a, a useful tip. So um, so Cytoscape, um, and this this. Uh, presentation is sort of leading into a demo of Cytoscape. So Cytoscape allows you to to zoom to kind of zoom in to a, a focused a focused network, as I as I'll mention. Um, and the other thing Cytoscape allows you to do is um, color and change the visualize the network in, in lots of different ways. So one of the uh, things that most people usually want to do is visualize gene expression data on their network. So Cytoscape allows you to do that. And um, but to do that, you have to um, understand two, sort of three basic ideas. So um, one is that uh, the networks that we talked about, nodes connecting connecting to each other, um, that's sort of just the, the network information. In addition to that information, there's usually a lot of a lot of extra information associated with the nodes and edges. So, um, for instance, you can have, um, uh, if the nodes represents a, a gene, you can have um, gene expression data across multiple different conditions or protein uh, peptide counts or um, uh, other information associated with the nodes. 
And the edges can, in, can uh, be associated with information like the type of interaction, whether it's a co-expression link or a, uh, a pathway link or a literature, a literature link. Um, it could have a, a weight on it, as Lincoln, Lincoln discussed. Um, the, so the edge can, can that, that weight can represent a confidence value, as I mentioned. So maybe you have um, um, very high confidence values indicate strong interactions, and, and um, low confidence values in, indicate weak interactions. So all of that data is associated with the network. You can pull in gene ontology terms, things like that. And then to visualize that, um, there's, a, there's a lot of different types of visual properties. So in, in Cytoscape, at least, there's all these different types of, of lines that you can rep use to represent edges. And you can have nodes that are circles or squares or arrows. You can have different types of, of, of arrows that might want, you might want to represent different types of information, like um, an arrow represents a directed interaction, as Lincoln mentioned, or a, a little T symbol here represents an, uh, might rep you might want to represent an, an inhibition um, interaction in a, in a network. Um, and these are all different types of visual attributes. So anything that you can imagine in terms of visual attributes, color, shape, size, borders, um, whether the thing is transparent or not, um, those are all different types of visual attributes. And to, um, to, uh, and, and what you want to do is sort of think about these two, these two types of things and say, okay, how do I want to represent individual nodes and ed, node and edge attributes as visual attributes? And once you figure that out, um, which is really a creative process, it's, it's, uh, um, and, um, um, by using Cytoscape later, we'll see exactly how to do that practically. But um, you, you have to say, okay, I'm, I think it'll be a good idea to represent gene expression data as color, and not just a, a color, but a color gradient from, from red to white to blue or something, where red indicates low, under underexpressed, white means it's, it's not, exp uh, it's, it's, the expression isn't changing, and blue means it's, it's highly overexpressed. Um, and so once you decide that, you can map your node and um, uh, edge attributes to visual attributes. So that mapping is something that you have to figure out. Um, so, um, and, and what you can get is something that looks like this. So here's a, just an example of a network that we mapped a number of different types of information on. So um, in this case, the, uh, and this is, this was presented in that, that Nature Biotechnology Primer that we passed around. Um, in this case, we represented uh, basically some aspects of gene function from the gene ontology, specifically cellular location information. Um, all the, the nodes in blue represent, all the nodes represent proteins, in this case from yeast, and the interactions are basically protein-protein interactions. And the, um, we colored the nodes based on general, fu general functional categories, um, which are relating to, to com mostly complexes and parts of the cell that these, these nodes are, these proteins are found in. So this is the kinetic core, nucleosome, um, replication fork, uh, and, um, and then the um, lines between the nodes are just straight lines, but they're, they're, there's different thicknesses. So um, the thickness represented some information from gene expression data that we had, which was how correlated these two proteins are, two genes are in, in gene expression data across multiple conditions. So if um, these, you know, these, if you, if you see a thick line between two genes, it meant that those two genes are always co-expressed at the same time or not, not, not co-expressed at the same time. So they track each other. Um, and then the, the, the last visual attribute we had, we had data about how high the expression levels um, were at the, the maximum amount. Um, in across a, across an experiment, and this is a, an experiment of, of gene expression over the cell cycle, I think. And the um, certain genes were were uh, expressed really high at some point, and certain genes didn't really get up to that much high expression. So the the bigger the circle, the higher the expression. And so um, just visually visually interpreting this, you um, you can get quite a lot of information out of this. And there's sort of three main patterns that we've um, that we've uh, found are, are uh, useful to with, with any type of network. Um, one is the guilt by association idea that we talked about earlier, and you'll hear again from Quaid later. Um, that is, things that appear close to, to each other in the network are more related to each other than things are that are farther away in the network. And if 
um, you know the function of um, these of, of, of genes, you can um, uh, infer that um, things that are functionally, you know, and you can you can sort of see here that all these the, the guys that are colored the same are in the same area of the network, um, and that's not really an accident. They're all functionally related and connected to each other by protein interactions, um, and you can use this this concept to predict gene function if you don't know the um, the uh, function of one of these genes, but it's close to a bunch of other things you know the function of, then you can predict that. And Quaid's going to go over that in a lot more detail. Um, the other thing, so that's sort of one idea, this guilt by association. Another, um, and it works with, with any, it, it can often work with any type of attribute that's related to the, to the interactions or edges that you're, that you're visualizing. Another idea is dense clusters. So um, you can see here that there's a few different parts of this, this network. It's not, you know, ev not everything's connected to everything else. There's um, a dense cluster here. These things are all sort of interconnected. Um, these things are all interconnected. And if you look at those, those in this protein-protein interaction network, they represent protein complexes. So, um, so dense clusters often mean something. Um, Lincoln mentioned uh, this before in, in his talk. Um, in a, in a, if, the, if this network represented social, like the, the, the Facebook network, dense clusters would be cliques, groups of friends that were all friendly with each other. Um, and in the protein interaction network, they, they represent, often represent complexes or parts of pathways. Um, and depending on your um, network, they, they could represent other things. So those are things to look for as well. Um, and then finally, you might just be able to see global relationships um, that, you know, the replication fork is not as connected to the kinetic core as the, you know, as the nucleosome is. Um, and um, those types of relationships might give you some sense about how closely connected general processes are. Um, and um, so you, you, and some of those might be non-trivial. So it gives you a good summary. So whenever you're looking at a network, you can use those three um, ideas to try and help to try and interpret it. Um, there's, there's actually a couple of different ways of, of representing, a few different ways of representing networks. Um, just to mention it, we're not really going to go over this too much, but you might, you, some of these might be useful for you. Um, the typical, um, and just generally as a, as a concept, typically you, most people will work with networks in two ways. One way is a list of relationships, and this is if you have a spreadsheet with, um, with uh, gene A connects to gene B, gene B connects to gene C, and you just have a big list of those things. Um, that is sort of the, the default way that people store the information on their computer. Um, uh, and you can have um, weights or other attributes associated with those. Um, so here we have A connects to A1 connects to A2 and gets a weight of 1, A1 connects to A3 and it gets a weight of 3. Um, the uh, um, most most of these most of these relationships are not directed. They're just they're, they have they're they're they've got an arrow on both sides. In this case, it means undirected. But one of these things is is directed. Um, so you could have a type of interaction, a type of relationship that you map directed, undirected, undirected. It could be other other types. Um, blue and green here are highlighted as blue and green and blue and green here and these other representations so you can see what they look like in, in different representations. But this is this is the this is sort of this is the core concept of um, that you really have to understand to use network analysis tools. That you represent data and you can and think of these things as columns in the spreadsheet. One column, two column, three column, four column, and you can add more columns here that represent additional attributes in this case, in this case, when you're at, when you're representing columns, additional attributes in this type of format, where you have A connects to B, um, these attributes are associated with the relationship. So the fact that we have three here is associated with A connects to three. A one connects to A three. Um, three is is an edge attribute in this case. Um, you can also have a separate table of node attributes that you that you um, store your information in about nodes. Um, so the network we've seen these networks. This is uh, um, the net. This is what this network looks like as a list. Uh, sorry, this is what this list looks like as a network. Um, and obviously, it's much clearer how the relationships are. So this is really the power. This illustrates the power of network visualization. Um, some people also um, might want to represent networks as a heat map. This is we're not really going to cover this too much, but you might see this. It might be useful for you. Um, 
the a network is not cannot well you can think of it as the, a list uh, you can think of it as this network and you can also think of it as a matrix um, where on one side of the matrix you have all the nodes and on the other side you have all the nodes as well and you put um, you put uh, a color or a number in the matrix where node one connects to node two so in this case um, there's a1 connects to a3 and you can say a1 connects to a3 here and we've colored the, the more the, the, the strength of, the higher the strength of this connection the um, the darker the, the color uh, red here in this um, in this heat map view we've also clustered this heat map so we put columns um, that are similar to each other close together and that helps you kind of visualize things that are related in this in this heat map so you, a, a number of papers actually use this representation they find this representation useful the um, if you're really interested in when to use this one versus this one, in general, networks are 99, you know, 95% of the time people are interested in looking at networks. Um, but networks are only good for sparse when the when the inform the connections are sparse enough. If if everything is connected to everything else, a network is not a good way of representing it. So that then this heat map view actually becomes quite useful. Um, and alternatively, the, the heat map view is not great for sparse information because it wastes a lot of space. So all of this, this um, sort of yellow, light yellow color here is, uh, represents that there's no, basically means that there's no connection between any of these nodes. And so you can see there's quite a lot here and it's really just using up space that, you don't, that uh, is not useful for you. So in this case, this is a more efficient representation. So that's the, that's the relationship between them. Uh, any questions so far? Um, okay, so that was very basic, um, just some general concepts behind network visualization. It's not really that complicated, um, so we went over, uh, didn't take that much time to go through all of the information, but um, basically, you know, the key things, automatic layout is really required. It's the first thing that you need to do to visualize networks. Um, you can, f when, once you do that, you can start thinking about how the network is telling you about uh, what if you can find basically trying to find interesting relationships in your data um, and hairballs these these uh, highly connected networks that you can't really interpret um, can be avoided by focusing your your analysis and you can you can visualize a lot of different information at once um, it's useful so I, I didn't really mention this uh, I forgot to mention this but um, when you visualize information all um, all of these these uh, multiple different data on a network all at once, it is very useful to see the relationships among not just the genes, but all, also the, all of the other data that you're visualizing. Um, and so it sort of integrates a lot of different information together, and you can just quickly see the, 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 the um, relation, hopefully easily see the relationships. Um, okay, so any questions? So I'm going to switch to Cytoscape, and I'm basically just going to go through a demo of Cytoscape, um, going through the basics. What we've done in um, actually, I'll talk a little bit about Cytoscape first, and then and then go into the demo. Um, but what we've done in your in the slides that you have is um, I'll present a, f a few slides talking about Cytoscape, and then all the rest of the slides in the book are um, just copies of what I'll be showing you live, and they're there for your information so you can reference them during the lab. Um, we try to uh, take screenshots of the menus that you have to use to access different different types of features, so you can have it as a reference. Um, okay, so Cytoscape, as I mentioned, is a, a network visualization and analysis software, and this, you've hopefully all installed it on your, on your computer. Um, this is what it looks like. And it provides a lot of different um, functionality for literature mining and gene ontology analysis and um, searching, searching regulatory motifs and networks. Um, there's a lot of different types of information available. Uh, it's made available by a number of different groups. There's actually nine academic and industry groups that, that collaborate to build this software over the, since about 2001. Um, and um, um, the basic idea for, for using this type of software um, and network analysis in general is you want to collect information about relationships among, say, your genes in your list from different sources, databases, literature, 
expert knowledge. This is where you might know something about relationships among your genes that nobody else knows, so you put, you put that in there, and your own experimental data. And you collect that all together. Um, you, you build, you, usually you're collecting this in, in a spreadsheet like Excel or something like that, um, or tab delimited files, and then, um, but you can also load it from, from, from different databases. And then you visualize it and analyze it in, as, a, um, as a network in Cytoscape. So Cytoscape allows you to uh, manipulate networks. You can open them and visualize them. Um, it, it provides different ways of uh, different types of automatic layout. Um, it allows you to filter and query your network. So just give me everything involving protein kinases. Um, it, it allows you to search different different interaction databases, uh, which we'll we'll talk about. So you can pull in. Um, protein interaction or pathway information from different sources, and um, there's a uh, um, act, that's sort of the basic functionality of Cytoscape. But there's a there's a really big active community around Cytoscape that that um, makes available um, uh, quite a lot of user information, tutorials, and case studies and documentation. And also, there's uh, a lot of the the analysis functionality comes from Plugins. These are things that you can download that extend the functionality of Cytoscape. So, when you download Cytoscape by itself, it does a really good job of visualizing networks, and it can pull in data from different sources. But if you want to do a lot of network analysis, you have to download additional plugins, and we can talk about talk about that. Okay. So um, that's basically that's basically it. Before we move to the demo, um, does everyone have uh, Cytoscape installed on their computers? How many people don't have Cytoscape installed on their computer? Has, ever, um, ha has anyone not verified that Cytoscape is working on their computer and tried it out? Has, it, has everyone tried it out? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's uh, one caveat that we saw a couple, with a couple of people had problems with. Um, when you start Cytoscape, there might be a couple of different ways of starting it, and if you um, double click on the Cytoscape jar file, it won't load any of the plugins. So it'll look like Cytoscape's working, but there actually will be this window. The first thing that will tip you off to that is this window at the bottom will be missing because this is actually a plugin. Um, so you have to start Cytoscape depending on how you installed it using the um, Cytoscape icon or um, if you're on Windows, the batch file or um, um, something that, that will load the plugins up. Um, okay, so. Um, basically, I'm going to go through just giving you a tour of Cytoscape, and then in the lab, um, we have some specific instructions of files to load up. Um, I'll be loading up the similar files, but um, um, you can mostly watch me right now just to see what Cytoscape can do and ask questions um, to see if there's anything interesting. So usually, uh, once you load Cytoscape up, you you want to load up a network from somewhere. So um, Probably the, the, the simplest way of loading up a network is if you have a network from some other source um, that you've been collecting um, and you, uh, you have it available as a text file um, or an Excel spreadsheet, you can, you can click on load a network from, from table. Um, um, let me try this here. So, um, I'm going to load up files that are available in Cytoscape's sample data directory. So on my machine, I've, I've installed, I've got lots of versions of Cytoscape, but they all have a sample data directory. And that sample data directory is filled with all sorts of basically little files that you can try out. Um, a lot of them are called gal-filtered. They they're start with gal-filtered. That is the, um, it's a network of um, DNA protein-protein interactions and protein-DNA interactions that was derived from a paper um, almost 10 years ago that was looking at um, um, uh, how different tr uh, transcription factors or regulators of galactose metabolism were, um, if you knock them out, how they affected the, the, the network. Um, and there's some gene expression data associated with it. With it. So um, this is just a, a the problem, and it's a, it's a reasonably sized network, so you can, you can use it and get the idea of how Cytoscape works. Um, so there's there's a lot of different versions of networks in of, ga of this GALF filtered network in here. Um, if you um, and I'm going to load up an Excel. Let's see if I can load up. Um,
Yeah. Okay. I'm actually gonna I'm I'm gonna load up. I forgot that the Excel thing is um, only for nodes here. So I'm gonna um, import a network from um, multiple file types, and um, I'm gonna select CIF, the SIF format. So the SIF format is a simple interaction format. Um, it's basically just that, like that list representation that I showed you in the presentation. Um, there's also GML, which is more complicated format, and XGML, which is even more complicated format. So those are really formats. SIF format is the sort of a sim the simplest version. Um, so I'm going to import this here, and the first thing that you see, so it says that 331 nodes were and 362 edges were were loaded, and um, the first thing you see is the network is sort of randomly organized. So, um, as I mentioned, you have to go and, and lay the network out. So, the layout menu has lots of different types of layouts. So, I can try the circular layout that organizes everything in a circle. Um, let me just make this a bit bigger. Um, the force directed layouts that that I mentioned are um, there's quite a there's quite a few some of them are actually called force directed like this cytoscape layout force directed um, so that looks pretty good and um, some of the layouts are not called force directed but they are actually force directed the Y files organic layout is one of the nicest layouts that that looks pretty pretty good um, so there's a there's a version of, or, of force directed that's called organic. And even this, this um, um, spring embedded layouts are, are also a type of force directed. So there's, there's different types of force directed. Here's a um, hierarchical network. So this isn't really a hierarchical, um, here's a hierarchical network layout. This isn't really a hierarchical network, so it doesn't really look great. Um, I'm going to go back to the organic layout. Okay, so that's your layout algorithm. Um, the next thing that you probably want to do is interact with the, the network. And um, if the network is fairly big, you won't be able to see much. So you have to zoom in to see what's going on. And I can click on, there's some mouse shortcuts for this, but I'm just going to click on this zoom button here. And eventually, as I zoom in, I start seeing the um, nodes and edges. Um, and you can actually see the labels on those, those, those nodes. I can click and move these things around. I can click to select a set of them and move them around. Um, if I want to move around from to different parts of the network, I can use this, this navigator window here. Um, so you can click this little circle and move it around to see different parts of the network. Say I want to zoom up here to see these little guys that are separated. Um, I, can, I can do that. Um, so the... Um, you can also do, if I wanted to rotate this, you can go to the layout option and you can say rotate and you get a little box that pops up here that, that um, allows you to, oops, I rotated the whole network. If I click on this little box, rotate the selected nodes only and you can, you can rotate those around. Um, you, can, you can scale them so you can make them, oops, and I need to select scale selected networks only. You can basically make the edges in general longer or shorter, and there's also aligning and distribute. So, so you can. This is going to make this ruin the, the layout of this network, but I can just align them all. Um, so these these little um, options here allow you to um, work with manual layout if you if you're not satisfied with the layout. Basically, manual layout means that you're going to click and drag nodes. If you want to align them in a, in a line, you can use some of these tools or scale them. Some of those are useful. So I'm going to turn this off. Um, and um, we lay out the network. OK, so that's the um, You can also select a, a bunch of nodes. And then you can zoom in to the selected region. Okay, so one of the things that you'll notice if you are working with, with networks a lot, especially bigger networks, is um, Cytoscape doesn't show you all the information on the that's, that's being visualized 
when you zoom out to a high level, and it just does that for performance reasons, so you can interact with a network without drawing all the details. Because at this level, you can't really see all the details anyway. But if you if you do want to see the details, you'll notice that as I zoom in here, um, eventually the node labels become visible right there. So if I zoom out a bit, the node labels disappear, and that is um, that level the level of zooming and the level of detail that you get are. Um, controlled by different preferences in Cytoscape, but just one tip, if you want to always show the detail, there's a little, um, in the view menu, there's a, there's a button called Show Graphics Details, and it'll just force the, the labels to be on all the time, and you can then, um, that, might be, that might be useful for you, especially with very big networks. So, it, so in this view, uh, the length of the, um, of the bridges between the nodes, or the, length, the length of the edges, is created uh, uh, automatically, to, yeah. Ar automatically and arbitrarily to make it into a nice looking. Note. Yes. But you're, you're, so by moving the nodes around, you're not in any way changing the. Uh, correct. <coughs> correct. Yeah. So that's a really important point I forgot to mention with automatic layout. So most automatic layouts, by by default, don't consider any information on in the length of the. They don't map, uh, represent information in the, the length of the edges, um, but some do. If you have a, a weight associated with the edge, you can make stronger weights, stronger edges, closer, uh, shorter, and, and weaker edges, longer. Um, and I'm not really going to go into an example of that, but um, there is this Cytoscape edge-weighted force-directed layout, um, and there's also an edge-weighted spring-embedded layout. And those can be useful if you have weights on, on the edges. Um, OK, so the other, so you know, that's, that's the basics of moving around this, this network. Um, okay, so I mentioned that um, you need the, the, the sort of the, the basic information is about a network, so if I click on these, there's really not much more information loaded into Cytoscape right now other than nodes and connections. Um, so to, to load more information, I need to load attributes, and there is um, an Excel file um, that is available in that sample data directory that I'll load with, with attributes. So this import menu, um, I, I used already net, import network, multiple file types. So there's various file type, net, types of network file types that, that Cytoscape loads. You can also load a network from a table or Excel. Um, and you can load, load a network from the web, um, which I'll go over later. Um, and then this section here is importing information about attributes. Um, so I'm going to load attributes information from a table or 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 um, Excel file, and if you ever load text files into Excel, this interface is very similar. So um, let me just cancel out of this first. You can load node or edge attributes here. You just have to select which one you're loading. Um, you can even load network attributes. You just have to select that. Um, so I'm going to load node attributes. I'm going to select the um, and this, the files that I'm actually using are will be list are listed in your in your in the lab slide in your books. Um, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open this gal exp data pvals file, and that stores a bunch of expression data about the nodes that I loaded in. And when I click open, you'll actually be able to see what the file looks like. So this file has um, gene, some common name of the gene, and then some expression data. And um, this is actually showing you what it what it looks like here. You can make that bigger. Um, so Cytoscape, this this importing attributes from tables by default is thinking about tab delimited file formats. In this particular case, the difference the the, the uh, separations between these numbers and, and values here are, are spaces. So I have to click this little box here, um, show text file import options, and then I get a bunch of options about you know is it do, do we need to think about tabs or other things? So I'm going to click Space. As soon as I click that, um, Cytoscape recognizes that um, it, it puts these into the proper proper format, and there's different columns. Um, I also notice in this file that the top, the first line of this file has names for the columns, and by default, this this loading panel doesn't doesn't load those up. So I'm going to um, click this this button. Oops, this button here. Transfer first line as attribute names and start at import, import row one. So if, as soon as I click that, these those names jump up here. Now now the columns are named by something that I that I 
like. Um, so one more thing when you're, when you're loading this up is um, there might be columns that you want and columns that you don't want to load up. So one of the problems that I'm going to face here is that some of these columns are named the same. So this is called gal1rg, and this is also called gal1rg. If I try to import this, status cable will give me an error. It says you can't have two column names with the same name. So um, you see these little check boxes here. You can click on the, the, the column, and it will, turn, it, will, it will select it for import or not import. So I can just click back and forth, and, and I'm going to get rid of these guys because um, they're, they're named the same. And this, this, this is the information about fold change that I want to import. This is information about the, the uh, p-value um, of the fold change, how significant the fold change is. I'm not going to worry about that right now. If I wanted to import that this way, I'd have to actually rename these, these um, columns in um, a spreadsheet. Okay, so I think I'm done here. There is um, um, one other thing that's fairly important. Um, I'm going to turn off which I don't need to do here, um, but I'll, sh I'll tell you why. Um, so I'm going to turn off the text file import options, and I'm going to um, click the show mapping options. So when you are, um, when you've loaded a network, the, the names of your nodes, say those are gene names, gene symbols. Um, often people will use gene symbols for, for the names of the nodes. Those names have to be unique. You can't have repeated, um, you can't have two nodes that are called the same name um, with the same identifier um, visualizes two nodes. Cytoscape will just see, any anytime it sees a, a node with the same identifier, it will put them together. It will just consider them the same thing. If you want to have multiple names for the same thing, you can load those names up as attributes and visualize the attributes separately. But the identifiers in Cytoscape for the nodes are um, have to be unique. And they, if you want to load attribute information on nodes and edges, you need to um, understand that what type of identifiers you used for your nodes and have those matched in the file that stores the node attributes. So um, in this case, I was lucky because the first column in the, um, in, the, in the file that I loaded up has gene symbols, in this case just these yeast gene symbols, and the node names, the node IDs in, in the network that I loaded up also have the same symbols. So Cytoscape can recognize that YHR051W over here is the same as YHR051W over here, and it will then link all of this data into that node. If you don't, if, if, you, if, if your first column of your data is something else, it's not an ID, then this import won't work immediately. And so if that's the case, you can just click on the show mapping options, and you can select, select the column that is the primary ID that should be used to match your node set. So if you, just to repeat, if you, have, if you have your primary ID always in the first column, you don't have to worry about this. But if you don't have it and you find that, it's not, that your attributes are not loading up, this could be one of the problems. You just haven't um, matched up the, the names properly. So I'm just going to leave that because it's, it's fine. And I'm going to import that. OK, so one of the problems with, so everything imported, one of the problems with the current version of Cytoscape it doesn't tell you that everything imported correctly, and you don't actually get any feedback. So this is a, something, a, a user interface bug that we have to fix. Um, and so I'm going to have to show you where that data went. And so you'll know, and you can, you can look for it next time when you're loading in your own attributes. So, um, so this um, panel here we haven't really used much. This panel here is pretty important because we're using it to navigate. And this panel I, I haven't talked about. Sorry, this, this panel stores the, just has the list of networks that I've loaded up. You can load up multiple networks, and they'll all kind of be shown here. Um, so, um, so, the... Yeah. So, if you load multiple networks, what happens? They just appear beside the... They'll, they'll be in different windows, and you can click, you can use this panel to select back and forth and go back and forth between them. Okay, so I'll not, show you that. Yeah. Used to do no. Existing no. Networks. You can do that if you want, but that's merging networks. That's a separate operation. Um, the if you're if you're so that's a good question. So if you have lots of different networks up here, the um, ideally I can test this, but um, ideally if you select the network here. Um, well, actually, the, the attributes are fairly global, so um, there, there is a way...
Um, can't remember the exact way of doing this, but I might. If I can't figure out very quickly, then I'll I'll stop and I'll figure it out later. Um, oops. It's the wrong import. So I'm just trying to answer Lincoln's question here quickly. Um, Yeah, I, I think that um, in general the attributes are loaded globally um, and you need to select, uh, so they, they might, if you have the same IDs in multiple networks, the, all the networks will get all the attributes. And um, a way to avoid that is, uh, there's different ways to avoid that, but that's actually something that in a future version of Cytoscape you're going to have control over so you can load up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I can talk to you about that that later. That's sort of the, the general way that Cytoscape is working is the attributes just get loaded up. Um, okay, so so I've I've loaded up my attributes and you can't see them now. So um, I'm just going to show you talk talk about this um, panel here. This is the data panel. Um, this is where you can see the data that you've loaded up, and you can click on this button right here, which is meant to represent different columns, and if I click on it, I can see that the columns that are available, and none of them are selected. It would be ideal, I think, if, if they were selected automatically. And I can, um, I loaded up uh, the gene name, the common name, and I loaded up these GAL1RG, GAL4, GAL80. Um, I can uh, click on those and click on the common name as well, and then I click outside of the box to get rid of it, and there they are. They're, they're in this um, you can see that they've been loaded up here. So that, that showed up because I had selected one of these nodes. Um, the nodes are by default, so when I click on a node, it selects it and colors it yellow. So I can also select a bunch of different nodes. And um, as soon as I select them in the, in, the, in, the menu, in the network, all of their attributes become visible here. And I can scroll up and down and see, see information about them. Um, you can also select nodes in here, and af as you select them, they'll be colored green. So that's sort of an additional selection um, thing. If you don't want, if you loaded up the wrong attributes, you can delete attributes. So I can I can delete some of these attributes, and they'll be they'll be gone. You can start again. Um, you can also create a new attribute here, and this this is completely editable. It's a little bit like Excel. But you can click on these things, and if you double click on it, you can actually change the name of um, things. Um, so there, I changed the name. I can change these numbers if I want. I can create a new attribute and just type information in. It's usually not very e efficient to do that. Usually, you're loading it in from Excel. Um, and there's some other there's some other sort of functions over here that are less less used. Um, so, okay. So I have I have a network. I have attributes, and um, um, right now I I, I have um, node attributes that I'm showing here. I can also select um, edges. So when I select edges, they turn they turn from in this case they turn red, and I can click on the edge attribute browser here, this little tab, and click there, and I can see what I can see attributes that I've loaded up for edges. In this case, there's only one attribute, which is the the interaction type, which was in that SIF file. And there's different types of um, edges here. Um, there's PP, which stands for protein protein and PD which stands for protein DNA. You can name your interactions anything. Cytoscape doesn't know or care about anything, at what, what information you're loading in. You can load any kind of network. You can name your edges and nodes anything you want. It doesn't have to represent genes or proteins. It could be rep representing anything, any people or anything. Um, and you just make up these names. They just have to be consistent. Um, Okay, so before we move to mapping the, the attributes to the, um, okay, so I'll, maybe I'll just do attribute mapping right now. So, um, okay, so I have these, I have the nodes, edges, I have the attributes here. I can click back and forth between the edge and node br browser. This is important to, to recognize because some people accidentally click on edges and then they can't see their node attributes, so they need to go back. Um, and now I want to um, visualize these 
this, this, these attributes as, as um, visual properties in Cytoscape. I want to do that mapping. Um, and this is pretty much the unique, most powerful feature of Cytoscape. Um, and the, this visualization <coughs> mapper. So if I click the, this tab up here, this mapper, um, I can manage visual styles. And visual styles, so this mapper maps attributes to visual, data attributes to visual attributes. Um, but it also manages just the default styles. You can save different styles. Um, a style is a set, is a, is a mapping, and a mapping, you can mul define multiple mappings. Um, the defaults are, um, the default visualization is shown here. So this is uh, showing one interaction. If I click on this, I can, I can change the default appearance. So I can change um, node properties, edge properties, and global properties. And this is a good way of, um, this is a good place to play around with Cytoscape and just try and see what the, what the different visual properties do. Um, it shows you what they look like and what they all are. Um, and you can um, change them. And then you can see that updated in this picture and also in the, in the network. So I'm going to change the node fill color to something else like green. So that changes the color. Now all the nodes are green back here. Um, I'm going to change the border color to blue. And now, now the borders are blue. So you can change the node size, node label, all of these different um, um, attributes you can, you can change. You can, even, you can even create a tooltip if you want that um, where I now mouse over the node and I get these little tooltips. In this case, it's not very useful if I just call them all hello. But you can map your data to tooltips, and then you can see the, the, that particular type of data um, coming up. Um, let me get rid of that one. And then you can change the node label position. So if you click on the node, this is the position of the, the editing the node label position. So I can take my label, and I can just drag it anywhere I want. So say I want the labels to be here. Um, then that's press OK, and now all labels move. So it's very powerful, actually, how you can um, you have quite a lot of control over all the different different attributes. Same thing with edges. Um, what happens again when you change the node to a um, I'll show you. I tried it, and nothing nothing's happening. To you, have to, you have to you have to you have to hover your mouse on the node, and then you'll see the tooltip pop up. No. Yes. Yeah. I'll and show. That will pledge it to all, to it's all not. It's not very time. useful to change it here because that that will apply to all your nodes. I'll show you how to change it in a in a node specific map version, so you can you can um, pop up information about a node by hovering the mouse over it. Um, and just one more thing, I'll show you some of the the different edge. Um, oops. Here's some different shapes that are available for, for arrows. So in your, in your notes and on the presentation, I showed you a lot of different shapes that are available. We actually added new shapes in the latest version of Cytoscape 2.7, and you guys are all working with 2.6.3, which is fine. It's not that much new. I'll tell you what's new. Um, but one of the things that's new is that there's a lot more line shapes, line and, and node shapes. So when you, if you go home and you, you work with Cytoscape 2.7, you'll see more options here. Um, OK, so that's just, as I said, this, this editing the default appearance is just a fun way of playing around with the, the network. Um, and I'm going to cancel out of there. Um, or I guess it's not canceled. But, um, so, but now I'll explain the real sort of utility of this menu, which is um, mapping node, uh, your, your attributes, your data attributes to your visual attributes. So by default, um, so this is a fairly complicated um, user interface here that I'll, I'll take you through. Um, but basically, you have uh, your active visual mapping is at the top here. And then these are all unused. They're called unused properties. These are all properties that you haven't used, you haven't mapped. And you can, you can um, scroll down here, and you can see all the different properties. There's node and edge properties. Um, so by default, the only thing that's mapped in this default visual style that comes with Cytoscape is the ID. So the, um, when I select I didn't really mention this explicitly, but when I select nodes here and I see them in the in the um, data panel, um, the all the nodes the node the 
the node ID is, in this case, these gene symbols. Um, and so that node label is, um, so th this ID is mapped to node label, and that's so that I can see the node ID here. Um, I can change the um, label to something else. Say I want to change it to the gene expression data that I loaded in. If I click that, now all the labels, the node labels, are these numbers here. Um, that might not be that useful for you. Usually you want to have um, some name that's, that's useful. Um, but that's sort of the, the general idea. You can select um, a, uh, a visual property, in this case node label, and you can select the type of data from here, and then you select that they're linked together. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's different types of mapping. This one is called a pass-through mapper. Um, there's actually three types of mappings. The pass-through mapper just takes, oops, the pass-through mapper um, just takes this data and passes it right through. And that makes sense for certain types of visual properties. So um, node label, it pretty much is the only thing that, the only type of mapping that makes sense, um, that makes sense with node label is pass through. You pass through data here to the node label. But if you have other types of information, this will be more clear as I show you more examples. Um, say I want to visualize gene expression data as a node color. So I go down here and I find node color. And I, it says double click to create. So I double click. And it bumps it up to the top here, to this um, area where the ones that I'm, the sort of active properties are being used. And it says, please select a value. So I select. Um, one of my gene expression values here. These gene expression values are just full change values, normalized around zero. So negative is underexpressed and positive is overexpressed. Um, I guess that's full, normal full change. And then um, I have to select a mapping type. So I select um, a continuous mapper. Um, pass through mapper doesn't make sense because passing this because this is not a color. If I pass this number and it becomes a color, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, so normally, for, for numbers, I will use a continuous mapper. So I click that. And by default, um, deselect all these nodes. By default, you get a, a, a simple gradient here that goes from black to white. Um, and it says, if I put my mouse over this gradient, it says, click to edit this mapping. So I click on that. And I get a little um, window that pops up that shows me the gradient. And um, it shows me that the minimum value of my attributes is this. The maximum value is this. It's sort of selected automatically these two values to be kind of um, close to the minimum, close to the maximum as a default. Um, and these little, uh, these little triangles here, I can play with. I can move around. So um, if, I'm com if I like this color scheme, I can, um, but I'm, 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 I'm not, I, I want to change the maximum and minimum where the colors change, I can just click these uh, triangles and I can move them around. So as I move them around, um, so say I move, move this down so that everything that's close to zero is white, then you can see the, no the, the network updates um, automatically. So I can move this and um, I'm changing the gradient live. Cytoscape is calculating this gradient automatically based on the numbers in this, this attributes. We do the same thing here. Um, Anything that's below this, that's on this side of this triangle is one color, um, and then the gradient is actually defined between these triangles, and then above this triangle is, is another color. So you can say everything above a certain number is just going to be green, and that will tell me that it's an outlier. Um, if I want to change the colors. So this would be a way to visualize your full changes, for example. Yes. Say anything above 2 or below um, point 0.2 is considered significant. Set up your gradient that way, and then you can just look at your network and say, hey, these are my significant gene products. In if, terms of if you wanted to just see the significant ones as a single color, you could do that. But usually, you want to show the significant ones as a color gradient, and you want to um, ignore the ones that are insig not significant. So maybe you'd, you'd set up more gradients here. I'll show you how to do that. Um, that a more complicated gradient that shows only things above 2 and um, below negative 2 as a uh, color gradient. Um, so this is sort of meant to be a visual, a visual thing. So um, I can, I'll just show you two more things here. You can double click these triangles. And if you double click them, you, um, you can select the color. Um, so I'm going to select red here. And now, now the nodes are going from red to white. Um, so you can also add, um, the last thing I'll show you is you can add a point here. If I click add, I get this little other triangle here. 
And now I'm going to um, set up a, a more complicated gradient where zero is um, white and high, high, high colors are going to be blue. And, um, and low colors are, are red. So now this sort of sets up a um, uh, negative full change is red, positive full change is blue, and things that are not changing too much are white. If you want to um, do what you, what you mentioned, um, you can uh, add another point here and, and have um, define that point to be like um, a, a range of white in the middle. That's not, um, that just, if it's, if it's white, it's not telling you much. Um, you can also click on these. Um, if you click on one of these, these um, um, triangles you, and you're not satisfied with the number that's selected here just by dragging, you can, you can actually change the, the, the size of this window and that might help you um, get a little bit more control over this dragging. Or you can, um, you can change the actual number here. So if I want it to be exactly zero, I just type the zero in here, press enter, and now this becomes perfectly zero. So, okay, so that's, that's basically the complete um, functionality of this little panel. As soon as I close it, this thing updates. Now I see that the, that the visualization, that this um, um, gradient, what it looks like. And you can see that all of the uh, node colors, I'm going to go back to the network panel here, and I'm going to um, move around. I can see the different node colors. The expression is now visualized on my network. Um, and similarly to this, you can, um, you can visualize any type of data. It's just up to your imagination. This expression, so what I showed you here is I loaded up a network. I loaded up gene expression data um, as node attributes. Uh, I looked at those node attributes. I noticed that the gene expression data is all full change, it's numbers. And then I mapped those numbers to a color gradient using, uh, of node color using a continuous mapper. Um, I'm going to show you that tooltip thing now. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask questions, ask if there's questions. So um, you can go down here and look at the tooltips. Um, you can have edge tooltips or node tooltips. Um, so I'm going to double click here and I'm going to select the common name to come up as a tooltip. So I haven't sort of loaded up the common name before. That was one of the columns in the attribute file I loaded up. Um, so I'm going to click that and it is a pass-through mapper because it just passes the common name through to the tooltip. Um, and now when I go on this node, I can see the, the node ID is the label. Um, but if I mouse over this node, now the common name comes up as the tooltip. So if I'm exploring this network, I can show additional information as a tooltip that only pops up when I put the mouse over it. So that's just one of the, one of the, the features, and there's dozens of them here. Um, if I had multiple types of gene expression data, I can, um, if I had multiple type, multiple gene expression values, um, I could, or if I had significance values, I can do something else. Um, I could, one, one useful thing is to um, show the expression value as the node color and the, um, the p value you might want to show as the size of the node. So small nodes are not very significant full change and big nodes are much more significant full change. So I if I had the p value loaded up here, um, I could do that and then I would, um, um, but I'm just going to try to show you how that works with just one more with um, node size. So I'm going to, I'm going to take node size, um, node size here, and I'm going to um, map another gene expression value here, continuous, and um, I double click to create. Now this, this size, little size thing comes up and says node size will be 10 if it's really low fold change and it'll be 30 if it's really high fold chain. But I can add another point here and drag this, drag this, uh, oops, to drag this uh, triangle here. Um, and I'm going to make this kind of pattern where I have big nodes for high fold change. And um, if it's in the middle here, um, around zero, Then, um, then it's it's small. The node is small. So I'm going to close that and see what happens. So now, um, let's see if that worked. So there's a um, that one didn't work. That was a, a node that doesn't have any information about it. So that didn't look like it worked too well. I might have I might need to change the. Uh,
Maybe make this a lot bigger. This may not be working. So the node sizes are slightly different, but maybe I'm zoomed out too much to, to see them, and so I can't uh, really see the, the difference too much. Oh yeah, there, there we are. So now we have high fold change or bigger. I think I just didn't, like, the nodes are too small, so I didn't, I didn't make the, uh, the node size big enough to really see on this level of zoom out, but you can see that the node sizes are different. Um, so I'm going to go back to the this map running, delete that mapping, because it's not really useful. So I'm going to... Um, yeah, I could make it... Yeah, yeah, I could make it a lot bigger, and it, you would see the, the results. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it should work. It should work to make them to make them bigger. There's the, the node size, so thanks for that. Um, let me zoom out a bit. Yeah, so now you can see the, the size is changing a little bit more, obviously. Um, yeah, so that's what you'd have to do if it was really zoomed out. Um, but if, say, I, I wasn't, uh, if I tried this out and I wasn't interested in it, um, what I can do is I can um, delete these mappings if I, if I want. And um, there's... I have um, I have the node color represent representing this gal one rg expression values full change values and I have node size represented representing this gal adr um, expression values so I have them both at the same time. Um, well now yeah so now this network actually has there's th there's four types of information that I've mapped onto this network there's the node label which is the id. There's the tooltip, which is the common name. The uh, node color is the full change of one of the exp expression experiments, and node size is the full change of another expression experiment. So, so this is a, this would be useful if you wanted to see the relationship between two expression experiments, um, and you want to see, so you want to look for a very dark dark. You want to see what was upregulated in one and and also in the other. You'd look for big nodes that were red or something like that. So now you can you can just quickly. Um, this, I guess shows the, the power of this, this at least simple visualization. You can quickly just scan scan this network and you can see, oh, this, this, this section right here has a lot of big red nodes. Um, so this must be mean something where these, these, these guys are um, highly expressed in both, in both um, expression experiments. And so you can immediately see that just by browsing around. You don't have to do some complicated formula to calculate that. You, it's just, so it's an exploratory me mechanism. It doesn't, it's not giving you a value on that, but it is telling you where they are. So when you're exploring, you can see them. And if you put more, more, more types of information on here, you can see more, um, more um, uh, you basically see more of those types of relationships. You have to set it up so that it's answering the question that you want. Um, so the, um, so you can set up, if you have, there's about 20 different attributes for nodes. Um, not all of them are qu very quantitative. So size is quantitative, color is quantitative, um, the node border color is quantitative because it's a color. You can also change the node border size. You can change the node width and height separately. So you can have you can look for different patterns like really skinny, thin nodes are you know in um, big in one dimension, and if they're they're flat, then they're small in another dimension, another type of data. Um, but if you run out of those things, um, they're, they're sort of, um, you, you may run out of those, those, uh, those um, uh, the number of visual attributes that you want to map. So I'll show you one other thing with a plugin later that um, displays, shows a different type of display for s certain types of information. I just want to make you aware of this plugin. Okay. So um, should we, um, I think, Michelle, I think I was going to try and take up all, all the time to lunch with Cytoscape and then, yeah, and then after, um, um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll let people play a little bit Sorry, for lunch. Yeah. Can you invert the approach? Here you put the network first and then you find the data over the network. If you don't know anything about the network you're dealing with, can you put the data in first and have Cytoscape find the network to fix? Um, you can't, Cytoscape won't find the network um, by default. 
you, you give, it's like Word, it just loads up data that you type in. Um, and it, the, there's, uh, there may be plugins that help you, um, given a set of genes, find in the network, and then you can, you can pull in more data based on a set of genes. So Lincoln's going to talk about one of those plugins later, and then Quaid is going to talk about even another one of those plugins, plugins later. So those are more advanced analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And then the information that network is available from websites that we can download? Um, yeah, so I'll show you that next. Let me just show you quickly how to delete uh, mappings, and I'll move a little bit quicker. So if you right-click on, on one of these mappings, you can, um, you can do different things, including delete the, delete the mapping. I have to right-click here, I think, um, on, the, uh, on this section here to, to delete the mapping. Um, but if you, you can also generate um, different colors, and um, there's some sort of shortcuts. So let me delete the node size mapping. Can you sort of save that? Like, don't show up now, but I'm going to later. Do you think that you think this is there or not? Um, you can create multiple mappings, multiple visual styles, and um, they, you, can, you can use this little menu here to create a new visual style, and then that gives you a blank visual style, or you can copy an existing one, and then you can work with it. Um, and then you can switch back and forth between them. Um, so here's uh, one that's supposed to look like the universe, which is too, too dark. Um, here's another one that's sample that shows a different, different visual style. So you can flip back and forth between them. Um, OK, so I'm going to move through a little bit. Um, that, that's really the basics of, of Cytoscape. There's a few other basic things that I want to just show you. Um, let me go back to our default here. One is that if your network is really big, you might want to zoom in on it. I told you that that's important. So just showing you how to do that, you can select a bunch of nodes and edges. And in the file menu, you can, um, you can create a new network from selected nodes all edges or just the selected edges, so usually I do all edges. And as soon as I do that, um, I now get another another menu, another win, um, network popping up here. It's a child of this network, and I can play with that one separately from, from the other one. I can make it um, um, fill up my screen, for instance. And now if I click back and forth between these guys, I can click back and forth between them. So that's really only useful if you have some values to select by. So um, there's a filtering system in Cytoscape that allows you to create a, um, I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly, allows you to create a, um, a set of filters that you can query your data by, like give me everything that's overexpressed in this tissue if you have tissue information. Um, you can have a fairly complicated set of filters. But the first thing I want to show you is this little thing up here, search. So by default, when you type in values into there, type something in there, it will search the node IDs. And so I, if I type in Y, then I get YL03, and I'm going to just press Enter, and it zooms in to that, to that node that it matches. But this, this little um, thing is quite a lot more powerful than, um, than just that. If you click the, the box next to it, you can configure the search options, and that search can be um, executed on any data that you load. So um, I'm going to click full change here and apply. And now, instead of having a little box that I type in, I have a little slider bar, and I can select a range of expression values. So um, I'm going to select all the negative um, full change guys. And they sort of are automatically selected as I um, move this thing. So once I'm happy with that, I click that. And now I can select that. I can move those guys to a new network. And this is the network of everything that has um, negative, everything in my original network that is negative um, full change. So that's, you can do pretty fancy things with that. If I'm interested in more complicated things, I can use this filters panel here, and I can create an, uh, a new filter, um, and then I can take any attribute like that gal1, I add it to the filter, and then I can do the same thing. I can say, okay, these guys, um, add these guys, um, and then I can make I can do Boolean combinations of those, so I can just select the, the most um, overexpressed stuff, and I can apply that and select everything. So, um, and you can create multiple filters. Now, when you're ready to save set your Cytoscape session, you can save it. 
This, the file will be called a .cys file, .sys, Cytoscape, session file. Um, that's really a zip file that contains all the information about what Cytoscape is, so Cytoscape is storing. If you unzip it, you see what's inside there. But um, And then later you can you can open that um, late, uh, later to, to, to start up again. So the normal thing that you do to start Cytoscape is you start working with the import menu, importing things in, and then once you have stuff in there, you can save it as a session and then open the session later. Um, one, that's basically it for most of the functionality of Cytoscape. There's a help menu and there's a help desk that you can email, um, but otherwise there's quite a lot of information about the contents of, of um, the, there's quite a lot of help available. There's also this little error console. If you have problems with Cytoscape, you can click on that error console and you'll see um, information um, that all of this information is actually normal. Um, but if there's some error there that you're having problems, there might be an error there. You can you can you might be able to see it. Um, okay, so just one more um, one more thing. Actually, yeah. Okay, sorry. Two more things. Forgot to show you the the web services. So your question, give me network information. So this assumes that you have network information from somewhere. You can download it from different websites. Um, but there is a way of getting network information for, uh, from within Cytoscape by default without adding any plugins. And it's in the import menu, import network from web services. And um, by default, you'll get a, an, an option that says import from Pathway Commons. But if you um, add more web services, which you can get as plugins, you can um, find additional options here. Um, but I'm just going to try the Pathway Commons one. So the st step one is you search for Gene. Unfortunately, and the reason why um, I'm not more, even though we made this plugin, I'm not more positive about it right now for this course, is that it doesn't allow you to select a, uh, to give a set of genes. Um, you have to give it one gene at a time, and the a future version you'll get a set of genes. Um, and some of the plugins that we'll show you later allow you to start off with a set of genes and grab networks. The only issue with getting these networks from these diff diff different places, as Lincoln mentioned, there's problems with coverage versus depth. So Reactome has, you know, only, you know, doesn't cover every gene, um, but um, it, it might be quite useful if you're just interested in overlaying gene, your gene expression data on specific pathways. So you can do that with this plugin. You type in a gene or a pathway name. So I'm going to just type in TP53. You can select, there's only a few organisms that you sel can select um, to search specifically, but I think if you do all organisms, it will find anything that Pathway Commons knows about. So this is a database that Lincoln mentioned that has a lot of different um, pathway databases. So I click. Um, I clicked. I gave it p53, and I said, "Okay, what's what's um, what do you know about p53?" And it takes a little while, and it downloads a whole bunch of stuff. So um, I'm going to move this over here, and so you can see the results. So I can I can select different different p53s that it found. So it found p53 in mouse. Um, it found p53 in human. And if I click on p53 in human. There's a whole bunch of pathways that it finds um, from Reactome, NCI, Nature Pathways, and Cancer Cell Map. Um, and there's also interaction networks. So I can download, there's 1,100, almost 1,200 interactions for P53, and there's different types. I can filter by data source or by interaction type. I can just give, me, I can just give the physical interactions or the complexes that it's part of. Um, but I'm going to go to the pathway one. And I'm going to check, check one of these things, like one of these first pathways here. So it says double-click pathway to retrieve. If I double-click that, it will go and download the pathway from Pathway Commons. This is the Reactome version of this G cell cycle pathway, G2M checkpoints. And um, when it's finished, it didn't break. Looks like, looks like it didn't really work that well. Um, it, um, I'm going to move this over here. So. I think that it, it didn't didn't work that well. So it actually did um, load up the the network, but it didn't lay it out. It just loaded up as all. It looked like a square. So this is some bug that we'll have to fix. But if I lay it out with the layout algorithm, um, then it you can see the, the the pathway there. This is all all the relationships in the pathway, um, and probably this vismapper um, style is. Um, uh, it didn't get, yeah, so there was a, a visual mapper style that this is supposed to apply that gets applied there. 
Um, but if I zoom in on this network, you can see that. Um, yeah, so this is. I'm just going to quit Cytoscape and start again so that I can show you that properly. Oops. Do. So I'm going to um, import network from web services, type in BRC1 this time, maybe it's a little bit smaller. And I'm going to um, get this React on pathway and double click. And there it worked this time. Um, so now, even though it's not laid out, it shows you the visual style. I'm going to lay it out using organic layout. And now I see this, this pathway here um, that has a whole bunch of information about it. I'm going to close this network import network panel, because otherwise I don't have that much room on my screen. And um, now I can uh, um, click on these nodes and I actually get a little bit of information about them from Pathway Commons. This is a complex. These are proteins. There's also small molecules on here. Um, and if I um, select a bunch of these nodes and look at the um, data that's associated with them, all of their IDs are just these numbers. Those are pretty much random IDs. But I can select a whole bunch of information about them, like synonyms and the entree gene IDs. and now that that information is being pulled in here. So these are the, the names of the proteins, the entree gene IDs. If you have your gene expression data, um, in this case, this is a human pathway. So if you have your gene expression data from human and you and associated with entree gene IDs, you can load that up and visualize your gene expression data on these pathways. Um, and that, that's actually very useful um, if, you're, if you're looking for specific pathways. Um, any, the, the, the problem with the, so what you'll find when using these tools is that the field yet hasn't solved this problem completely of gathering all the information that is known about the gene. So you can go to Reactome and you can get everything. Reactome knows about pathways. Um, I, I put a bunch of links in the wiki, um, in the workshop wiki. So one of them is um, IREF Index and IREF Web, which is a, a database that is made um, partially in, uh, or a website that, that um, is made in Toronto um, by Brian over there and uh, Shoshana Wodak's lab that um, uh, collects protein-protein interaction data from every, almost every protein data, protein interaction database. But then that has all the protein interactions but not all the pathways um, and it doesn't have, um, it, and none of the patent, Reactome or IREF index doesn't have information about um, functional associations um, except the, the, for the human ones that, that, that Lincoln showed. So if you want to collect all the information about the gene for any organism, there's no site, there's no like complete one-stop shop yet that you can just say, like NCBI is like a complete one-stop shop for publication information or Entree Gene is, you know, is pretty good for any, any gene. But um, for pathways and interactions, there still hasn't connected yet. So you might have to go to different sites and merge the data together and work with Excel to if you're, if you're really interested in building the most complete network possible. And that's, uh, there's a number of papers that have come out that do that, and the, the author of the paper actually spends a fair amount of their time just collecting network information about their genes of interest, and then they can work with it. Once they have that resource, they, it's their own little database. So that's usually the current, the current um, activity. In the future, you'll just be able to hopefully just do that in one button press. OK, any, any questions? Oh, okay. So, um, if I had, um, if I have another network here, if I if I want to load something else from from um, from Pathway Commons, um, like this network, this other um, ATM mediated no, something. Yeah. So, um, there is a a plugin called Merge Networks that you can use to merge networks, and we'll say, okay, do you want to take the union of the networks or the intersection of the difference, and if the IDs for both networks are 
the same, like you can, like node A in network A in network one is the same as node A in network two, then they'll be linked and they'll all be merged. So if you have different, different network data, you can merge them like that. Um, if you're loading in data from pathway commons, there's another way of merging, which um, it will ask you when you double click on another pathway, do you want to create a new network or merge with this? And that will allow me to sort of build up a bigger, bigger network. Um, and I want to lay it out. Okay, so didn't really lay it out very well, but um, yes, uh, the pathway commons um, it knows how to merge things um, automatic uh, correctly. But if you have your own networks, you have to make sure that they have the same IDs if you want to merge them. Otherwise, they'll just look like two different networks. Any other questions? I want to show you one more plugin, but we can take more questions. Yeah. Oh, just the general question. Do you Told us the, not, um, the most current version the and you didn't say why. Oh, um, the, the 2.7? Um, it you can actually use 2.7. I, I didn't I didn't mean to say that you shouldn't load it. Just the 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 instructions the for the course um, when we sent out we said 2.6.3 and the reason I did that is because the entire demo here is verified on 2.6.3 and I didn't want to um, take any chances with the new version, which only came out a few months ago. Um, but I've been using 2.7 quite a bit, and it's it's pretty good. There's a couple of new new features which I'll mention of time right at the end. I guess we we're pretty much out of time now. Um, so I just want to show one more. Th yep. Well, actually, I guess here, just to, because I've, I've heard much been, um, you know, the necessity of having a uh, the same network, which I think is just another argument that that if you sort of think. You're Yeah, so if you make sure you pick the right, like a good stable IDs at the beginning and not just um, any name, then that will, will help you a lot. So, um, okay, so one more thing that I want to show you. If you want to um, download plugins for Cytoscape, there is a link on the workshop page of where to get plugins, where to see descriptions of plugins. But if you click Plugins, Manage Plugins, I think you guys have already done this to install your own plugins. You can go shopping for plugins here, and there's a whole bunch available that um, you can you can select. I've installed the the, the Vista Clara plugin, and one of the um, I'm just going to open a. Did you install too many plugins? Um, you technically you can't install too many plugins, but sometimes a plugin that you install might break your Cytoscape for some reason. So if you just download all the plugins right away. And some people do this. They just download every plugin, and then the plugins in might interfere with each other. And then you can't get Cytoscape to work the way you want, and you'll have problems. So you shouldn't do that. You should just download plugins one at a time and understand what they do. I'm just going to um, load up the gal filtered um, session file. Um, this is the same network that I showed you last time, but I just wanted to show you the Vista Clara plugin. So the all the steps that I showed you with the mapping your gene expression data to color, um, you can do automatically with the Vista Clara plugin. Um, if I click on the Vista Clara, when I load up the Vista Clara plugin, it adds this little tab at the bottom here. And if I click that, um, I have to start by clicking Sync. And um, Vista Clara then gets all of the gene expression data from the network and puts it here in its own little window. Um, and it shows you the gene expression as a little heat map. Um, and then what you can do is you can, you can press this play button here and it will cycle through the gene expression and just show it to you as a movie. Um, and it's it's um, probably hard to see here because I think there's so much information. It's actually at the very end here, it's cycling through these different, um, these different uh, um, uh, expression, the three different expression experiments that are loaded up. Um, so if you have lots of expression experiments you want to play a movie, you can do it, you can do it, or you can just select one of these um, and as you as you click here it will it will change the view. So this is like an automated way of helping you do the the visual visualize your gene expression data and actually calculate all that visual style stuff automatically. You can also do one more thing here. You can right click on this on this here and there's all sorts of interesting views that you can do. Like you can do an ink blob view which shows you this shows you this as a different different view if you like that one. And you can also display heat strips which are 
little things that pop up on this on this um, on this network, and you can zoom in and you can see that um, that um, there's a, the gene expression is mapped as a little bar chart under each node, and so that might help you visualize multiple gene expression experiments at once. You can turn off the heat strips. So that's just an example of a plugin that does something interesting. Um, it's a good plugin for gene expression visualization and exploring gene expression data. Um, I happen to, it, it was the data that I loaded up originally, the, um, the gal filtered example. But you have to load up your gene expression data first. So you load up your network and your gene expression data as I showed you with the gal filtered example. And the, um, and the instructions for the files that I used are in, the, in your, um, in your um, binder. Um, but then once you have that, you can, you can press the synchronize button and it will, it will gather all of that information. So the size of the file that you input in terms of gene expression, you may have a network of limited size, but your expression data may have way more. Right. That was a good question. Does, does, it get, does it select only the things that it recognizes? Or by default, it when, yeah, by default, when you're loading in expression data, it, um, it loads up only the expression data it needs to to show on the network. And if you have add new nodes later, you won't have the expression data. But there is a way of forcing Cytoscape to load all of the expression data. So when you when you um, load up attributes from table, I think um, you I think there's um, there's this button here, import everything, and that will just make sure that everything's completely loaded up. So here, if you had you know, the entire genome, and you had a small network, it would give you the expression data for all that network. Plus a whole bunch of other it wouldn't show you the it wouldn't show you the other information. You have to have a node or an edge okay. um, to show the information. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So, how many people were kind of playing along um, while I was doing things? Okay. So, there's there um, we have to deal with. A little bit of timing. This lab was supposed to be probably taking too long. So if you want to play along, you might have some. Um, we don't have the the, uh, um, the evening session tonight, but hopefully we'll have some time in the afternoon. I don't know. Do we? I think we do because there was. Um, um, I think I'm covered. I've covered everything that I was wanting to cover, and there's a, a, an afternoon session for me as well, which is just continuation of this lab. Yeah. So um, you can try it. You can try it with some of your own data. Um, it's, a, it's a big package. Um, what we tried to do here was give you the the basics, then core concepts, so that um, you will understand how the system works, and you can download new plugins now. You can load up your data, and you understand how to load up data. Um, but there's a lot of different places you can get data for. A lot of different ways you can visualize things. Um, and to to learn more about Cytoscape, you should really try it out with your own information and your own data. And um, after lunch, we have some, some chance to do that. But um, you can't do all of it in a day So um, there, there's, uh, because it's complex. So, um, But hopefully, the, the stuff that we've given, what, what I'm trying to say is hopefully the stuff that we've given you today allows you to um, not worry about to understand everything so that you can, you can do it yourself later. You have a good grounding. Um, Okay, so I guess we're we're at lunch now, um, and uh, we'll come back after lunch and play with Cytoscape more, and then Lincoln will give a, a, a demo of a particular Cytoscape plugin that helps you do what he showed you, does what you, he showed you in the in the in his presentation, given a gene list, download a network, and do some network analysis on it, which is pretty cool, um, and. Um, but during that time in the afternoon, it just, be, just after lunch, you can ask more questions uh, to everybody about Cytoscape. OK? And um, so one more thing. Sorry, I put, I put a bunch of links in the Module 3 wiki uh, section on the wiki page that points to interaction databases that are, that are cool. And some, I, I, I mentioned some additional plugins there and just gave a brief description about what they do that are plugins that are um, particularly useful that pe people like to use a lot. You can check those out.